It's dark outside, almost 2 a.m. You go outside and look at the sky, and here it is, bright, full moon. You might think you know a lot about Earth's natural satellite, but let me ask you this, how did it form? The answer is, nobody knows. But of course, there are theories. The most popular one, called the Giant Impact Theory, claims that the moon formed during a collision between Earth and another planet. This planet must have been smaller than ours, the size of Mars, and the collision itself probably happened around 4.5 billion years ago. Another theory, called the Capture Theory, claims that the moon used to be an asteroid or some other wandering body. It formed somewhere else in the solar system. When it was passing by Earth, it got caught by our planet's gravity. But here is one catch. Our planet and the moon have remarkable isotopic and chemical similarities. So, they must have a linked history, which means the moon couldn't have been created elsewhere. Other experts think that at some point in the past, Earth was spinning so fast that some of its material broke away. It soon started to orbit our planet. That's how the moon appeared in the sky. But again, there's one problem. In this case, the proportion and type of minerals on the moon would have to be the same as on Earth. But there are slight differences. The moon is richer in materials that form very fast at high temperatures. There's one more theory, and it's probably the least exciting. It claims that Earth's natural satellite could simply appear along with Earth during our planet's formation. Duh! But these days, a more urgent question keeps astronomers busy. Is the moon really Earth's satellite? Or are these two twin planets? The moon is big compared to our planet, about one quarter of Earth's size. That's why some experts refer to our planetary system as a double planet. But how correct is that? If we want to figure it out, we need to give the definition to the word planet. According to the International Astronomical Union, a planet is a space body that orbits the Sun, is massive enough to have a nearly round shape thanks to its gravity, and has cleared the region around its orbit. Now, what about a satellite? It's an object in space that orbits around a larger celestial body. If we take the system Earth the Moon, its center of gravity, called a barycenter, is inside the Earth. That's why at the moment we can't say that we live in a twin planet system. According to this definition, the Moon is the satellite of our planet. Now, let's get back to the past, like 3 or 4 billion years ago. Even though the Moon wasn't a planet, it most likely had a full-fledged atmosphere. It formed at times when powerful volcanic eruptions were rocking our satellite. Gases spread all over the Moon's surface, and it happened so fast that they didn't have enough time to escape into space. At that time, the lunar surface was covered with basins filled with volcanic basalt. Just imagine ginormous plumes of magma hurtling high into the air, falling to the ground and creating lava flows. That's how the basalt basins appeared on the surface of the Moon. At one point, scientists got their hands on samples brought from the Moon. They found out that lava flows there contained not only carbon monoxide and sulfur, but also the building blocks of water. Thanks to these samples, researchers managed to calculate the amount of gas that rose and formed the atmosphere. It became the thickest around 3.5 billion years ago and existed for about 70 million years. After that, poof, the atmosphere was lost in space. But the coolest thing? When the Moon did have an atmosphere, the satellite was 3 to 10 times closer to our planet. One computer simulation even suggests the Moon was probably up to 19 times closer than it is now. The distance between it and our planet could be 18,600 miles, while these days our satellite is around 240,000 miles away. That's why the Moon looked much, much bigger in the sky. Unfortunately, at that time, not even dinos were around to admire the view. These days, the atmosphere of the Moon is almost non-existent, and that's why the satellite can't protect itself from meteorites. The surface of the Moon is dotted with craters. For comparison, there are about 190 identified impact craters on our planet. Many of them are hidden by vegetation or covered with water. But if we speak about the Moon, 
the number is so much greater, several million, and around 5,000 of them are more than 12 miles across. And since the moon is less seismically active than Earth, these craters and other ancient formations stay in perfect condition for centuries. When you look at the moon, it's the brightest object in the night sky. But in reality, its surface is dark because the reflectance of our natural satellite is just a bit higher than that of asphalt. You might know that the moon's gravitational pull causes tides on our planet, making the oceans bulge out on both the side closest to the moon and the one farthest from the satellite. But that's not all. The moon also slows down Earth's rotation. This phenomenon is known as tidal breaking. It increases the length of a day on Earth by a bit more than 2 milliseconds per 100 years. The moon is also moving away from Earth at the same rate at which your fingernails grow. That's about 1.5 inches per year. If one day the moon floats away into space, our planet will have to live through tough times. Without the stabilizing pull of the moon's gravity, Earth's tilt would start changing wildly from no tilt at all, meaning no seasons, to a large tilt, resulting in extreme weather. Even though the moon's surface is mostly dormant, Earth's natural satellite still experiences moon quakes. One theory suggests that they may be happening because the moon is shrinking as its insides are cooling. Scientists say that the moon has become around 150 feet skinnier than it used to be several hundred million years ago. To help you understand it, picture a grape turning into a raisin. It wrinkles while shrinking. The same is happening to the moon. It's shrinking and it's wrinkling. But unlike the grape, the moon doesn't have flexible skin. Its surface is hard and brittle. So as the moon gets smaller, the crust cracks and breaks, and its sections get pushed over neighboring parts. Want to know another cool thing about the moon? A recent study claims that it has a tail. And every month, it wraps around our planet like a scarf. This slender tail is made up of millions of atoms of sodium. And our planet regularly travels directly through it. Meteor strikes blast these sodium atoms out of the moon's surface and further into space. For several days every month, the moon remains between the sun and our planet. That's when Earth's gravity picks that sodium tail. Our planet drags it into a long stripe that wraps around its atmosphere. This lunar tail is totally harmless. It's also invisible to the human eye. 50 times dimmer than what you can perceive. But during those rare days, high-powered telescopes can spot its faint yellowish glow in the sky. The tail looks like a gleaming spot that's five times the full moon's diameter. And the spiciest fact for you, Two or three years ago, an asteroid was pulled into Earth's orbit and started to travel around the planet. Even though it was no larger than an average car, it was still a big deal. Out of more than one million asteroids astronomers know about, it was only the second one to orbit our planet, called 2020 CD3. It was our temporary mini-moon. It didn't stay with Earth for long, though. The asteroid followed a random orbit and slowly drifted away. Temporarily captured objects such as 2020 CD3 are rare. They need to have a specific direction and speed to be caught by Earth's gravitational pull. Otherwise, they either crash into the planet or fly in another direction. Okay, show of hands. Who still believes that the sun goes around the Earth? <laughs> Nobody. Oh, but everybody used to. It sure looks like it does. The sun comes up in the east, the sun goes down in the west. The sun comes up in the east again, so the sun goes around the Earth. It seems intuitively irrefutable, and it is so. But it's not true. The sun doesn't go around the Earth. Everybody knows that, but only now. So why do people still believe the moon goes around the Earth? It's not true either. We have to go back over 500 years to begin to get an idea of how hard it is for science to change universally accepted facts. Nicholas Copernicus, around 1510, was the first to propose a heliocentric, sun-centered, solar system. But he didn't do it publicly. Copernicus privately circulated letters to other astronomers, explaining why the accepted fact of an Earth-centered solar system should be scrapped, 
in favor of a more straightforward, more astronomically correct, sun-centered solar system. Copernicus's difficulty in promoting the sun-centered solar system depended on another bold conceptual innovation, that the Earth rotates. Copernicus's concept of a rotating Earth flew directly in the face of five literal statements in the Bible that the Earth was founded on a fixed foundation never to be moved. And the Catholic Church wasn't about to let that worldview be challenged or changed. Copernicus had too much to lose to go public with his revolutionary, pun intended, heliocentric theory as a churchman himself. 100 years later, Galileo Galilei wasn't so reticent. Galileo had observational proof to back him up because he had a telescope. In early 1610, Galileo first observed the moons of Jupiter and kept track of their orbits. Yes, the moons of Jupiter do orbit around Jupiter. They go round and round the giant planet in actual orbits, unlike, as we shall soon see, how our moon travels around the sun with the Earth. Galileo became famous, or infamous, as the case may be, because he discovered orbital motions that were not heliocentric, that did not fit the accepted worldview. It rattled civilization's Earth-centered cosmology. Galileo was indeed revolutionary. Later in 1610, Galileo observed through his telescope, which only had an aperture of one and a half inches, the planet Venus going through phases, just like the moon goes through stages. Galileo wrote that Venus imitates the moon in Latin in his notebook. There could be no other explanation for these observations. Venus was orbiting the sun. People were afraid to look through Galileo's telescope when he set it up in the great square of Pisa. They were too scared to have their worldview revolutionized. Strange as it may seem, we are experiencing something similar to that now concerning the moon orbiting the sun and acting like a double planet with Earth. People, scientists included, stubbornly persist in viewing the moon as its clever official International Astronomical Union name. It's a moon of the Earth orbiting around the Earth, showing its different phases throughout the lunar month, or moonth, as moon fans sometimes like to call the 29 and a half day cycle of lunar phases. Moon lovers' favorite day of the week, of course, is Moon Day. It comes right after Sun Day. But back to the science. It's how our school books portray the phases of the moon. It's what people believe now. Notice how the Earth is the moon's center, and how it goes around the Earth in a circular path. This is the geocentric view of the moon. It's what we see from Earth. The moon comes up, the moon goes down. The moon comes up again, the moon goes around the Earth. But that's not what's happening in space. It's way past time we copernicus size the moon. We need to start seeing the moon from a heliocentric point of view, as we do for everything else in the solar system. First of all, the geocentric view of the moon's phases shows the Earth stationary, sitting in the center of the moon's path for a whole moon, th a uh, month. But the Earth is not stationary at all. We're zooming around the sun at a very high speed anywhere between 66 and 68,000 miles an hour. Therefore, any picture of the moon going around a stationary Earth is profoundly misleading and really outright wrong. The heliocentric view of the Earth and moon moving together in space should look something like this. Notice that the moon is not going around the Earth. It's traveling along with the Earth, around the sun. The path of the moon around the sun is a sinusoidal path back and forth, back and forth, across the ever forward moving path of the Earth. Notice that the moon always goes forward too. It doesn't ever go backward to either the sun or the Earth. By always moving forward and sinusoidal, the path of the moon does not qualify as an orbit in the same sense that the other moons of the solar system orbit their planets in elliptical paths. Therefore, it is wrong to say the moon orbits the Earth. The moon orbits the sun along with the Earth, or the moon and the Earth both orbit the sun, are statements Copernicus and Galileo would approve of. But science today has difficulty accepting a heliocentric view of the moon. Maybe there would be too many books that need to be reprinted. Maybe too many astronomy professors would have to admit that they were wrong their whole careers. Accordingly, Objections are put forward to block the revolutionary heliocentric view of the moon from being universally accepted. 
One such objection is that the moon never leaves the Earth's gravity well, and therefore should be rightly considered a moon of the Earth, an orbital to use the astronomical term for satellite. Undoubtedly, the moon never leaves the Earth's gravity well, or else we would lose the moon. However, representations of this well-known definite fact always show the moon moving around the Earth inside the gravity well. And this is not true. The moon never goes back toward the Earth as it would need to if it were in an elliptical orbit. So the gravity well objection can be dismissed because the astronomers who propose as orbital evidence that the moon always stays within the Earth's gravity well fail or neglect to include the facts of the moon's continuously forward sinusoidal motion. Escape velocity for the moon to leave Earth's gravity well is reported to be about 2,684 miles per hour. Relative to the Earth, the moon presently moves about 2,238 miles per hour. What kind of impact would it take to accelerate the moon that extra 450 miles per hour needed to knock it out of Earth's gravity well? If anyone wants to compute that, you're most welcome to put your answer in the comments section. Maybe it could happen, and that would not be good. There's another objection to looking at the moon from a heliocentric point of view. And that involves the barycenter of the Earth-Moon system. The barycenter is the center of gravity between the Earth and the Moon. Think of yourself on a seesaw in the park. The other end of the seesaw is a massive lineman from a professional football team. How far forward towards you would the lineman have to move so that you both are balanced evenly? He'd have to move towards you almost to the center of the seesaw. You are the Moon and the lineman is the Earth. Although Earth is a feminine name. The balance point of the Earth-Moon system, the barycenter, is over 1,000 miles inside the Earth. It is this balance point, astronomers dutifully point out, that is orbiting the Sun. It is a heliocentric point of view. Copernicus and Galileo would approve. However, these astronomers always seem to add the geocentric animation of the Moon orbiting around the Earth, with the barycenter inside. In this way, they can keep the Moon orbiting around the Earth. But it's somewhat dishonest to combine two different perspectives in one animation. <laughs> you can't have your cake and eat it too. This leads us directly to the real sticking point that keeps us from believing that the Moon is orbiting the Sun, the double planet conundrum. The International Astronomy Union refuses to consider the Moon and Earth a double planet. They refuse to do so almost exclusively because the very center of the Earth-Moon system is inside the Earth. It's tough to buck City Hall, as the saying goes. You'll recall that IAU, or UAI if you use the French designation, demoted Pluto to dwarf planet status. And they still haven't reversed that decision, despite seemingly ample evidence that Pluto is the ninth planet. Perhaps we should reflect on what it means to be an Earthling. To be an Earthling implies that we know ourselves to be space-born people orbiting a yellowish star near the outskirts of a spiral galaxy. We, meaning all the peoples of Earth, live in space and are absolute creatures from space. Above us is the Moon, Earth's companion. We're making a big mistake by referencing the Moon according to our geocentric parameters. Our conceptual expansion into space is inhibited by an incorrect, outdated, Earth-bound view of the Moon. The universe doesn't revolve around us, and neither does the Moon. The space crew had been getting ready for the launch for over three years. The preparations for landing on the strange planet included gathering and studying rock samples in the Grand Canyon, exploring ancient volcano formations in the Nevada National Security Site, and looking into gas and lava vents, lava lakes, and pit craters in various locations in Hawaii. To be able to resist microgravity conditions, they learned how to walk obliquely by being strapped and suspended sideways and trying to move along walls. They had to test their limits through intensive diet and sleep regimens to make sure they'd be safe in outer space. It took them three days, three hours, and 49 minutes to reach the surface of this new world in a place called the Sea of Tranquility. They could have gone for the Ocean of Storms or the Central Bay but they chose this place to land because it had good visibility and it was relatively smooth and easily reachable with as little propellant as possible. One of the first things they noticed when they got there was that, well, 
the place kind of smelled. This may sound like the beginning of a science fiction novel, but it's actually the true story about how the Apollo 11 mission landed on the moon on July 20th, 1969. Since then, the moon has had 12 human visitors to this day. We think of it as our neighboring space buddy, but there's still much we don't know about this mysterious satellite. And that should come as no surprise, since the moon is actually always showing us the same face. That is because the Earth and its only permanent natural satellite are in synchronous rotation, which makes us think it's always permanently still. The truth is, it's not in a fixed position, and it is actually moving further and further away from the Earth each year by 1.5 inches. Believe it or not, the Earth and the Moon, although being 238,855 miles apart, deeply influence each other. While the Moon is partially responsible for the tides of the seas and oceans on our planet's surface, our Earth is actually to blame for movement on the Moon. They're called moonquakes, and they last way longer than earthquakes, some of them up to half an hour. It may look perfectly round to us on a warm summer's night, but the Moon is actually oval. The lemon-like shape is caused by the Earth's gravitational pull. Our moon features more than footprints when it comes to traces of humans. In 1969, American astronauts left many objects on the surface of our satellite, such as two golf balls, a drawing by famous artist Andy Warhol, and a message from Queen Elizabeth II herself. One of the last people to walk on the moon to this day, an astronaut named Eugene Cernan, scribbled his daughter's initials on the moon's surface in 1972. Since it appears there's no wind or any other type of weather change there, the letters TDC could remain there permanently. It's actually possible to be allergic to the moon. Harrison Jack Schmidt, an astronaut from the Apollo 17 mission, spent some time in a valley in the Sea of Serenity, then climbed back into the crew's lunar module but had some moon dust on him. Just as he removed his spacesuit, he got red eyes, sneezing fits, and other allergic reactions that lasted two hours. Since it's so close to us, we've established that the Moon has a time zone of its own. We call it the Lunar Standard Time, but it doesn't correspond to time on Earth. To get an equivalent, the explanation is a bit more complex, but in simple terms, a year on the Moon is split up into 12 days, each one about as long as a month on Earth. Each one of these days got its name after a different astronaut who has walked on the moon. The start date of this calendar coincides with the moment Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. So, the lunar year 1, day 1, began on July 21, 1969 at 2.56.15 Universal Time. Since the moon has a very thin atmosphere, it has some pretty crazy temperatures, both hot and cold. They can go up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Over by the moon's poles, however, the temperature is always at around minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Humans have tried to trace the connection between our natural satellite and the Earth for as long as we can remember, coming up with words to explain why the moon's existence influences us so. In the Middle Ages, scientists and philosophers thought that during a full moon, some people were more likely to experience different health conditions. Because they saw this inexplicable connection to the full moon, People with these symptoms were named lunatics, or at times, literally, moonsick. People are not the only creatures living on Earth that are affected by moon cycles. Dog owners are 28% more likely to take their pet to vet emergency rooms during the full moon. You may think that's the reason why wolves have this preference for howling at a full moon, more so in popular culture. But scientists haven't been able to find any connection between wolf behavior and the lunar cycles, so it might as well just be a myth. The largest known crater in our solar system is also found on our moon and is called the South Pole Aitken. This giant formation is located on the far side of the moon and measures 1,550 miles in diameter. One of the many things we've yet to fully understand about our satellite is the unusual flashes of light that can sometimes be seen on its surface. Scientists have named these outbursts transient lunar phenomena or TLP in short, and they have been seen all over the world for centuries. One of the first instances of TLP dates back to 1178, when monks from Canterbury claimed to have seen a flaming torch on the surface of the moon after the sun had set. TLP does not simply mean light flashes. 
Reports also have detailed other unusual events, such as gas-like mists, reddish, green, blue, or violet colorations, or even the darkening of certain locations on the moon. Is something strange happening with our moon? Is it the beginning, or did we just start noticing it with the newer space study equipment we have nowadays? There are a lot of different theories that scientists have developed trying to piece together what can be causing these events. The unusual flashes on the moon can be caused by anything from meteoric impacts to electrostatic activity. It's difficult to pinpoint the explanation for each event, since most of these episodes are recalled either by a single observer on Earth or from a single location. The fact that there is noticeable seismic activity on the moon can also explain why we can sometimes see unusual flashes of light on the surface of our satellite. When the moon's surface moves, it can cause different light-reflecting gases to erupt, which can explain luminous developments. Some scientists have even suggested that residual geologic activity may also be the cause. This is all the more shocking, given that we've always looked at the moon as a lifeless world. Did you ever notice that our moon can change its color? There are actually many scientific explanations for that. The moon appears to be a brown-tinted gray when you look upon it from outside of the Earth's atmosphere. When gazed upon from the Earth's surface, the moon appears to change color depending on various phenomena. The moon seen near the horizon will most likely be yellow or red-tinted. The rarer, blue-colored moon indicates that you're looking at our satellite through an atmosphere carrying larger dust particles. The moon can even appear purple at times, but what causes this specific hue is still up for debate. The fact that we don't know exactly if or how much water there is on the moon's surface is not the main reason why we aren't already building houses up there. It seems that radiation actually has a lot more to do with it. Recent studies have shown that the moon's surface has a radiation rate 5 to 10 times higher than that you experience on a transatlantic passenger flight. That also means it's 200 times higher than the rate on the Earth's surface. In future lunar explorations, like the Artemis project for example, scientists need to take this into consideration not to expose the astronauts. Named after Artemis, Apollo's sister, this program aims not only to place astronauts on the lunar surface in the future, but also to build some sort of an establishment there to study the moon in safe conditions. While the project started in 2017, the first planned mission is set for launch in summer 2022, with an estimated duration of 25 days. The space object with no crew on board is planned to reach lunar orbit and safely return with sufficient data for the next four-person mission scheduled for May 2024. Artemis 3, 4, and 5 are expected to be launched in 2025, 2026, and 2027 respectively, each with a planned duration of approximately 30 days.